Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more conversations. With us is Rick Lifton, who took office September 1, 2016, as the 11th president of Rockefeller University. Founded in 1901 by John D. Rockefeller Sr. and situated on York Avenue between East 66th and 67th Streets, overlooking the East River, Rockefeller is a preeminent biomedical research center offering postgraduate and postdoctoral education in furtherance of its dawning mission, science for the benefit of humanity. The university features 79 research labs and boasts 24 Nobel laureates now or formerly on its faculty. Rockefeller has been at the ramparts in the battle against many of the terrible afflictions confronting us all. Rick Lifton is a world-class geneticist. One of Rockefeller's areas of concentration under his leadership has been the use of genome sequencing as a detector of certain hereditary diseases long before such diseases present for diagnosis and it is here to tell us about it. Rick Lifton, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Well, um, we're delighted that you are here. And tell us something about your background. You went to Dartmouth. I did. You play winter sports? <laughs> no, I'm no <laughs> hockey player. No hockey player, no skier? Not much of a skier either, but uh, I went to Dartmouth. Uh, you know, I grew up in a military family, moved all over uh, the country and abroad and uh, landed at Dartmouth. Caught the bug for uh, doing science, uh, which was part of uh, my father's background as well. He was a doctor, wasn't he? A he physician. was. And uh, got uh, drafted into World War II as a surgeon and ended up uh, being, uh, by happenstance, an expert in radiation physics in the early days of the space race. This uh, is your father. NASA. Yeah. This and is your father. That's so, wonderful. So uh, it was uh, interesting exposure to uh, medicine and science at an early age, and I caught the bug from there, and uh, that was the direction my career took me. So you went on to Stanford and got both uh, a double discipline, an MD degree and a, um, a PhD in, uh, in science. And uh, did you ever practice medicine? I did. I did clinical training in uh, Boston at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And, uh, you know, when I went off to medical school at Stanford, it was clear to me that we were at the dawn of a new age where we were going to be able to use new technologies coming out of uh, fundamental basic science to be able to start to understand the causes of disease at their most fundamental levels. And uh, that's really w the direction that I've gone for uh, the last 40 years. Uh, I did clinical training uh, in internal medicine and then uh, decided to just go out and start trying to figure out uh, causes of important diseases that we didn't yet understand. So it was then that you became interested in hereditary diseases or a genetically caused disease? Yes. So when I started as a graduate student, we were just getting the technologies to be able to physically get our hands on any piece of DNA that was uh, of interest to us. And it was clear that the opportunities that we were developing in the 70s for being able to figure out the genes that underlie causes of uh, traits in flies would be equally applicable to humans. And so after I came out of my clinical training, uh, that's the direction that I went. The DNA molecule was discovered in the 1950s by Crick and Watson, the, the double helix. Uh, and tell us what DNA is and how that relates to the work you've been doing. Sure. So the stuff of life on this planet uh, all derives from DNA, and uh, the unique sequence of uh, our DNA is what makes humans humans, and uh, horses horses, and flies flies, and plants plants. And uh, that variation uh, among species is hereditary, and it's the stuff of, uh, of heredity uh, that makes life on this planet uh, uh, what it is and makes us uh, different from one species to another and inter-individual differences as well. And so what has really been evolving over the last uh, 50 years is the recognition that uh, uh, much of the underlying differences in our susceptibility to different human diseases relates to either inherited or acquired uh, changes in that DNA sequence. Uh, now, you came to us uh, here in New York about a year and a half ago from uh, Yale, uh, where you founded a center for a genome analysis. Yes. Uh, now, what is the relationship between the genome and DNA? Right. So the genome is the collection of all of the DNA in our cells. And uh, one of the principal things that the revolution in DNA technology has taught us is that uh, 
there are about 20,000 protein coding genes in the human genome and the, and the protein coding uh, genes, the proteins are the things that actually make uh, all of the biochemistry of life. They make everything that uh, uh, we're composed of and uh, everything is encoded in those 20,000 genes. So one of that's, the most, the, that's really the toolkit. That is the toolkit, and it's one of the most amazing, uh, I think, uh, recognitions in the last uh, uh, 20 years has been that uh, we use pretty much the same toolkit as every other vertebrate uh, on the planet. We, we all share pretty much the same set of 20,000 genes. And the fact that, uh, that that's true tells us that uh, uh, each of those genes is doing something really important, and it's the way that they're utilized that makes uh, humans different from fish uh, makes, and so forth. But makes we, us different from fish or fowls. So. Exactly. But we still have very little idea what happens when, uh, what each of those genes does. We know what happens in the context of a living human, what happens when about 3,000 or 4,000 of those genes are lost or mutated, uh, but we don't know what happens uh, with the remainder. And so we now have a pretty clear path to understand what happens when each of those genes is mutated. And that's one of the paths that uh, my lab and many others uh, are on uh, over the last uh, five years and looking forward for a ways, is to try to understand what the consequence of mutation of each of those 20,000 genes is in the context of uh, a living human being. And that will help define uh, what the opportunity opportunities are for diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of virtually every human disease. So how many genes in the human body? There are about 20,000. 20,000. Same and how, set. How many are implicated in hereditary disease? So we know of about 4,000 right now, but we recognize increasingly that virtually all of these are going to have consequences uh, if they are lost in one context or another uh, in humans. And in some cases, there may not be an obvious consequence unless we're exposed to a particular environment or a particular infectious agent. Uh, but um, almost all of these genes are going to have consequences when they're mutated. And importantly, these have been the targets for development of new therapies. Most of the therapies that uh, uh, we use now are based on target, tar either knowingly or unknowingly targeting uh, the products of one gene or another. And so this is going to define the set of uh, tools that we can manipulate for benefit uh, to human health. Well, your center at Yale was the Center for Genome Sequencing. Now, what's meant by sequencing? Right. So we know that uh, there are variations in the DNA that uh, change the, the structure and the function of each of the, uh, the human genes. And until about uh, 10 years ago, we did not have technologies to enable us to rapidly and efficiently determine the sequence of individual genes, much less whole genomes. And this has changed dramatically. When I was a graduate student in 1975, it was considered miraculous if you could uh, sequence a couple of hundred bases of uh, DNA. Today, we can sequence entire genomes, 3.1 billion bases of uh, DNA sequence, the individual letters, there are 3 billion of those in the human genome. And we can now determine the complete sequence of all of these for under $1,000. And we can determine the sequence of just the 20,000 genes, kind of the business end of the genome, for just a couple of hundred dollars. So the kinds of experiments that we can do today just dwarf what we could think about uh, even a decade ago. Let's consider for a moment the practical application of it. When you were at Yale, you applied uh, genome sequencing to uh, hypertension. Yes. Now, uh, high blood pressure. So uh, if I have high blood, blood pressure, why do I care if I got it from mom and dad or uh, whether uh, I got it because of the stress of life or uh, I just have it? You don't necessarily care why you've got it. What you want to know is uh, what can you do about it and uh, what can you do to treat it better. And when I started in the field of uh, hypertension, we didn't even know what organ the disease was caused by. It was hotly debated, is it a primary disease of the brain or the heart or the kidney or the adrenal gland or the vasculature? And uh, in such uh, an unknown terrain, our therapies were pretty empiric and not frequently well-directed against uh, underlying causes. 
vasculature of the blood vessels. Yeah, so, so we simply took uh, the uh, approach of looking at the people in the human population all over the world who had the very highest or the very lowest blood pressures on the planet and asked, uh, what can we learn from the study of those individuals? And it turned out that the people at the high and the low end had opposite effects on how the kidney handles salt. And the people with the very highest blood pressures on the planet, uh, their kidneys are hanging on to too much salt, and the people with the lowest blood pressures on the planet are hanging on to too little. And that's driving uh, how full the blood vessels are being filled with salt and water, and in turn, determining your blood pressure. And this has led to uh, recognition that modulating uh, uh, salt balance in the body is key to uh, reducing blood pressure and preventing hypertension, stroke, and heart attack in the general population. So this was your discovery? Yeah. You received a prize, you received recognition for it. Some, yeah. Some, yes. <laughs> okay, so then you move from Yale to Rockford. Now, uh, why did you want to make the change at this point in your life when you're making so much progress at Yale and uh, yeah. figuring out the cause of hypertension and other diseases? Well, I never thought I'd leave Yale. Yale is an amazing place, and I had a wonderful opportunity there, was there for 25 years, and uh, had the best time. And uh, when I was called to look at uh, the job as uh, president of Rockefeller, I thought, a lot of smart people at Rockefeller, you can find a president among uh, them. And uh, I told them, no, I was very happy to stay uh, at Yale, thank you. And uh, they called a couple more times and finally persuaded me to come down and take a look at Rockefeller. Now, of course, I had known about Rockefeller since I was a graduate student, and it has a remarkable history and is an amazing place. But uh, once I came down and looked at uh, the job and looked at uh, being at Rockefeller and living in New York, uh, it was really an overwhelming opportunity and one that uh, my wife and I decided we couldn't uh, pass up. The things that make uh, Rockefeller so remarkable to me are uh, the, its clarity of mission is just extraordinary. You know, unlike a major uh, uh, university, a large university, we don't have a football team, we don't have an English no department. No football team. <laughs> How do you yeah. do it? Yeah, we're not very good at that. But what we do incredibly well is fundamental life science. And uh, that clarity of mission uh, starts from the, science, the heads of laboratory and permeates through our students, through our staff. And that clarity of mission is uh, just remarkable and uh, really makes uh, Rockefeller an extraordinary place for doing biomedical science. Now, your organization is different from uh, the typical university. I mean, there are no deans, are there? And... Yeah, so we have a very flat structure. We only have 78 uh, faculty. Uh, uh, now at Rockefeller, and uh, we are not siloed in departments. We don't, uh, we don't have to teach uh, individual courses, so we're not thinking about who's going to teach this course. We have to recruit somebody for it. When we go out to hire, we go out to hire the people who are doing the most extraordinary and transformative work that is going to change the way we think about uh, their field. And uh, we give them uh, generous, longitudinal, long-term support with the expectation that we're hiring the very best people and we're getting out of their way and telling them to go do great science. And it's in that environment we, we're not siloed in departments. We don't have a bunch of geneticists on one hand, biochemists on the other, who are all talking to one another. Everybody's cheek by jowl uh, talking to one another. And from that uh, heady brew comes uh, um, the most amazing discoveries. Well, your predecessor, Mark Tessier-Levine, was, a, I guess you'd say, a neuroscientist. He was interested in the diseases of the brain. Uh, now, uh, you're at the helm. You're a geneticist. Uh, does this augur a change of direction at Rockefeller? I think the directions uh, overall remain the same of what can we do to change the way we think about uh, and understand uh, the science of life. And the things that I think uh, are amazing about where we are right now in uh, our history is the technologies are uh, so uh, amazingly rapidly evolving. So going back again to when I was a graduate student, the links between what we could do in basic science and how they related to medicine were 
pretty indirect and uh, theoretical. Today, we know that the same signaling pathways that we've been studying in very simple systems, from yeasts and flies and worms, are directly relevant to the biology in, that's going on every day in humans as well. And the ability to go from very fundamental science and model systems to humans has dramatically increased. And conversely, our ability to look at humans who have particular diseases and know that we can actually figure out what the causes of those diseases are at their most intimate uh, uh, molecular terms uh, are that intersection now is you know it's a it's a it's a freeway that's just running back and forth all the time and we have the opportunities in the coming years to understand the fundamental causes of every human disease and this is going to lay out the opportunities for preventive and therapeutic strategies for the next 50 years well you're describing the possibility of personal sequencing you bet uh, uh, so that uh, i could go to a, a center or a, a lab and they would what they take a sample of my blood or some other some, DNA sample, and they're able to predict uh, what diseases I might have down the road, at least what hereditary diseases. Is that kind of how it works? Well, it, it, we expect in many cases that that will be the way uh, it works. Today, the best example of uh, uh, this personalized medicine uh, it, it, at a fairly large scale is in cancer, where we know that cancer is caused by mutations in individual genes that lead to predisposition to uh, uh, cancer and development of cancer. And there, we now have very good examples where there are specific mutations that uh, I, if you're a, uh, someone who has never smoked and gets lung cancer, uh, it's very likely that you have a particular uh, mutations in a particular gene. And if you know that, uh, there are drugs that can be given uh, that uh, mitigate the uh, effect, the, the growth of that cancer. These are exa specific examples, but this is going to increase uh, as our knowledge improves. And it remains an untested uh, question as to f how many of us will be helped by getting our genome sequenced. Uh, but in many cases, uh, it's clear that we will acquire new knowledge that will help us uh, uh, determine what uh, particular diseases we're predisposed to and how to prevent them. Well, is it 100% foolproof? Uh, I understand there are instances where uh, you sequence a 65-year-old uh, man and find out he should have died when he was 35 of uh, some hereditary disease. You bet. So, uh, yes, so we don't expect uh, I, this to be uh, a, a universal tool that will uh, be of profound importance for every individual. What we do expect is that uh, we will be able to identify individuals, for example, with a hereditary predisposition to breast cancer, where we can intervene early and prevent uh, uh, the development of the disease uh, uh, altogether. Uh, this is, a, I think, an important example of uh, all, that's already in the clinic that uh, already exists. How costly is the test? Well, so uh, the actual cost of uh, doing the test uh, is rapidly becoming uh, a rounding error in the cost of uh, uh, anyone's uh, uh, medical care. Uh, what it actually gets charged out at is uh, perhaps another matter, and this is, these are societal issues uh, that uh, we need to uh, uh, work out what the reimbursement is going to be uh, for doing it. But the cost has come down by seven orders of magnitude. So it's, it's 10 million fold cheaper to sequence DNA today uh, than it was uh, 15 years ago. It's pretty so, remarkable. So roughly how much is it for a, a sequence? Well, so, so we can sequence all of the genes in the genome for a couple of hundred dollars. A couple of hundred dollars? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Is this something you recommend that everyone um, should do? I mean, have you been sequenced? No, I haven't. And uh, I think as we learn how to deploy the technology, I think we'll get uh, better and better. Uh, today, one of the uh, biggest risks is that we know sufficiently little about uh, the variation across the entire genome that uh, we can't interpret many of the changes. Uh, but as we get more experience and on a research basis, we sequence more and more individuals uh, and we get that data into accessible databases, if I want to understand my genome or you want to understand yours, 
the best way to interpret it is to compare it to the sequence of everybody else's genome that's ever been sequenced. And so we need to get uh, all of the data in searchable formats uh, so that we can take advantage of understanding uh, if I have a particular variant in a gene, uh, is that likely to be related to a predisposition to disease or is it completely benign? The best way to test that is to look across the entire population, people with and without disease, and see whether that variation is associated with disease more often than expected so have by you, chance. Have you captured a sufficient universe uh, right now so that you can uh, do a meaningful search? So for many diseases, that has been done. Uh, today, we can go out in public databases that uh, contain uh, about 200,000 uh, individuals. That's going to expand very dramatically over the coming years. There are projects right now that are being uh, initiated that are going to sequence 500,000 to a couple of million individuals. Uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative here in the United States uh, is underway with a, a goal of assembling complete medical record uh, data along with genome sequence, along with uh, biochemical analysis of uh, at least a million individuals, and uh, that will provide th the kind of database that will be very useful for comparing uh, our genomes to uh, everyone else's and comparing uh, predisposition to various outcomes. Are there ethical um, issues involved in sequencing, confidentiality? Do I want my boss or my insurance company to know I'm likely to die next year? Or uh, do, uh, are there, is there an ethical issue about whether I should share the uh, results of the test with my children? Yes, I think there are potential uh, ethical issues to be concerned about uh, uh, with these. And uh, some of these have uh, been addressed in part by uh, legislation. The, the uh, Genetic Non-Discrimination uh, Act uh, prevents our employers from discriminating against us based on uh, our genetic uh, constitution. Uh, however, there are people who uh, uh, are concerned about uh, having their data uh, knowable by uh, others. Uh, and for that reason, I, you know, right now, if uh, uh, you have your s DNA sequenced, uh, it can only be put in a database, for example, with your permission. So there's a lot of research that's done with uh, uh, informed consent, telling you uh, what your rights are and uh, you know, how your information uh, uh, can or cannot uh, be used. Uh, I think uh, for many diseases, uh, in my experience as a physician, uh, patients are completely okay with having their information uh, used uh, in this way. Um, and I think as a society, uh, we uh, in the United States are generally uh, uh, quite open to uh, research. And uh, my experience has been that uh, patients and families who have a particular disease are delighted to participate uh, in research and to have their uh, data be available. Uh, there are some diseases that uh, may be stigmatizing. Neuropsychiatric diseases are examples where people are somewhat sensitive about uh, who knows uh, you know, how the data might be used. Uh, but uh, in general, I think uh, I, that's being dealt with well in the public arena. Now, quite recently, you and a group of biomedical scientists uh, went to uh, the White House and met with the president, President Trump, in the Oval Office. Uh, did you talk to him about genome sequencing? We did. And uh, it, was a, it was a very interesting conversation overall. Uh, I think uh, the, you know, the major thrust of the discussion was to inform uh, the President and the White House uh, about the importance of uh, biomedical research, both to the health of uh, our nation and to uh, our uh, innovation economy. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's, it's not well understood uh, in some cases uh, that uh, the NIH budget, National, National Institutes Institute of, of Health, Health uh, the director of which is, a is your fellow geneticist, a Francis colleague, Collins. Francis Collins. Absolutely. So uh, the taxpayers support the biomedical research to the tune of about uh, $30 billion uh, a year. And uh, it's important to recognize that uh, uh, this is not directly, simply a cost center that uh, costs the American taxpayer every year. Uh, the return on investment uh, has been extraordinary. A child born today will live on average one year longer than a child born four years ago 
who will live one year longer than a child born four years before that and so forth. So, so the increase in longevity uh, has been uh, quite dramatic over the last uh, 50 years with lifespan today being about 82 years if you're a woman, 77 years uh, uh, if you're a man, uh, and that's about 15 years longer than it was just back in 1960. The other element that uh, the uh, NIH budget has uh, uh, directed uh, is tremendous innovation in the economy. It's estimated that about 5% of all GDP growth over the last 50 years has come from the development of biotechnology, which has occurred in the United States specifically because we have been the international leaders uh, in biomedical science. And uh, we have a trillion dollar biotechnology industry here in the United States that supports uh, about 11 million jobs uh, overall in the economy. Uh, and this more than pays for the uh, 30 billion dollars a year that we're investing every year. We're the envy of uh, the world in uh, our investment in basic science. Envy uh, the world in our investment in basic science. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. This has been absolutely fascinating. So I have a question for you, Rick Lifton, and that is, uh, have we come any closer to solving the riddle of hereditary disease? Yes, we have. So yes, we uh, have. So we are uh, moving fast. We're moving fast. Thank you so much for coming thank by. Thank you so much, This Jim. has been terrific. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.